Well, aloha and good morning. Thanks so much for tuning in here to Spotlight Hawaii, brought to you by Shamanad University. I'm Ryan Kalesuji, joined by Yanji Denise. And today we're going to be focusing in on the west side of the island of Oahu, speaking to two le leaders that know their community extremely well. That's right. We are joined this morning live with council members from the Honolulu City Council, Andrea Tupola and Augie Tolba. You also know him as Augie T. We are so happy to have both of you on this morning. Aloha. Um, Augie, I want to start with you, if I can call you that. Council member Tolba. Sorry, I'm so used to the other. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's good. I always, people always, you know, sit and do the same thing. Call me Augie. I'm, you know. I'm, I'm well, um, you know, we've been seeing, we have so much to talk you, to you about because there are so many issues at the city level right now, but we really want to focus in at the start here uh, on COVID-19 and sort of the explosion that we're seeing, the rise in cases, particularly in both of your districts. Um, Council Member Tobo, we'll start with you. What, what are you hearing on the ground and what are your concerns for your community right now? Well, you know, uh, my family and I, you know, we decided that we were going to get vaccinated because we felt it was best for us. You know, while I like to see most people get vaccinated because I believe it'll save lives and help slow the spread of COVID, I don't believe that it should be mandatory. I think it should always, you know, be your choice. So um, I understand there's challenges, but at the end of the day, I'm all about choice. And Councilmember Tupola, <laughs> wanted to get your thoughts on what's happening uh, here, especially with some of the cases that we're seeing here on the island of Oahu. Yeah, you know, I'm in agreement with Councilmember Tolba. Although my family's been through a different situation, we've all had COVID, myself included, and so I think. Some of the conversations that Lieutenant Governor has brought up in regards to including people who have contracted COVID into the numbers of vaccinations, all of this is un unveiling and unraveling itself day to day. And I think that we need to take that into consideration is that there's a large amount of people that have contracted COVID. What does that mean? There are some studies, although not peer reviewed, about the effectivity of those who have already contracted COVID. What does that mean for them if they do get vaccinated versus those who have never contracted it? I do believe that, you know, allowing the community to choose is uh, where most stance is. But I also do believe that having more testing events, you know, because the vaccination is a preventative measure, but testing is a detective measure. And in order for us to be able to determine where are the spreads, where are the pockets, where are the positive outbreaks, we can't stop doing testing. And I think that on the Big Island where Harry Kim was previously the mayor, and now we have Mayor Roth, they have been actively um, funding community testing. So they have one in Hilo, they have one in Kona, it's twice a week, they pay for all the county testing, and no one's forced to go to this. Everyone who goes to the testing events genuinely wants to know, maybe if they've contracted it, if they've come back from a traveling and they wanna make sure that, that they haven't carried it, we already have cases of people who have been vaccinated that are still carrying COVID. So I do believe it's important for us to actually increase the amount of community testing. I know that our state was given $46 million from the federal government to increase back to school testing. And I'm hoping that the DOE and the DOH will come out with that program this week to ensure parents that there's going to be this availability weekly for them that's being paid for by the state. I want to follow up on that. I was not aware that you had contracted the virus. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience of that? And, and given that, have you chosen to get a vaccination as well? Or are you stick? Are you relying on the immunity that you got from contracting the virus? Um, so we were in Utah last year and we had contracted the virus and it was not just myself, but the whole entire family. And I think there are states where there has been a lot more of early on spread, meaning that there's large amounts of the community that have gone through it and then passed on, meaning that it was able to go through the whole community, the whole system in such a way that now in 2021, those states, those communities don't have as much strip because a lot of people have developed this immunity. A lot of people have gone through the virus, the symptoms, and everybody has been reacting differently. For me, I, I still worked out every day. I went running outside. I didn't have any uh, symptoms. I didn't have a runny nose. I didn't have a cough. I didn't have headaches. I didn't have chest pain. However, my husband, my brother, they had other symptoms that I didn't have, and everyone's body reacts differently. My children who had it, they didn't have colds. They didn't have coughs or anything 
anything like that. So I personally am trying to make sure that I'm making the best decision for my kids and seeing as though there were some of the early on um, vaccinations that there were some adverse effects towards children. There was a friend of ours in Utah who he had taken the vaccine and, and developed a brain tumor and he was a junior in high school. And so I really wanted to make sure that whatever decision I make for our family is going to be correct, seeing as though we have been through the virus, we've contracted those symptoms, we've developed a level of immunity. To what level? I don't know, because they're still coming out with the studies as to how immune you are when you've already contracted it. How many days does it last? But we do know this for sure. When you're vaccinated, you can still contract COVID. We know this for sure that when you have COVID, you can get COVID again. So I think there are ways that we can actually protect ourselves and know that there is a defense thing that you can do with the vaccination where you can maybe defend it, but it still can come to you. So I think that it's very important for us to be healthy, to exercise, to stay active, so, you know, breathe fresh air outside. I just went running this morning. I'm a huge advocate of being proactive about your health and not reactive because by that time it's too late. We can make better choices as individuals and as families to stay healthy. I want to bring in uh, Councilmember Toba in this as we continue to talk about some of the numbers that we're seeing. You know, for your district alone, there's been uh, 200 cases that have been reported in the last 14 days. Uh, obviously, the uh, that, that's a big number for that community. Is there any sort of effort that's being made to make vaccine available for those in the area, or, or what are you attributing some of those higher numbers to? Well, you know, uh, I agree with the Lieutenant Governor uh, in his uh, interview couple of days ago that, you know, this college because of the gatherings and, you know, I, you know, like I hope I, my hope is that people would take the necessary precautions, right? Wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands. And again, there's an alternative. Go get, go get vaccinated. But again, it's your choice. I know there's a lot of like, I know uh, Kaiser Permanente has a, uh, an opportunity for people to get vaccinated in the next week. So there's uh, places in the community to get, and you have that option to go do it. So, you know what I mean? The the information and it's out, the resources are out there. It's just a matter of you taking the step to do it. Again, it's a personal response. It's a, it's a personal choice. Yeah. I, like I said, I have a, my family did it. My mom is a senior. Uh, I travel because I still have to do other things besides city council work. So I felt like it was important for us to do it. But again, I would never ever force anything on anybody uh, and make anything mandatory. Um, there's a lot of questions in the comments here. Uh, there, you know, people sort of responding on both sides, uh, council member Tupola, but Doug wants to know, did she answer the question, has Ms. Tupola been vaccinated? There's a lot of people asking if you actually had a, had a shot. I have not. And, and is that something, you know, do you agree with council member Tolba that people should get vaccinated if they, if they feel that they're so inclined? What is your stance on that? Yeah, um, I said that earlier. I said that if they feel like they should get vaccinated, they should have the choice to do that. We were actually uh, recommended by the Department of Health to have a window after we had tested positive to not retest and to not incur the virus back in your body again. And so I think that's where people who have contracted COVID have to make those decisions and have to work with their primary health provider to make the best decisions for their family based upon what happened to you when you contracted COVID, how did you react to it? And all of us in our family reacted differently. You know, Councilmember Tobo, one of the things that the county mayors have been discussing is the possible um, ruling that they may make it mandatory for county workers or for city workers to be vaccinated in order to report to work or maybe go through testing, but uh, there is some talk to make that mandatory for county workers. Would that be something that you would be in favor of if the mayor moved in that direction? Again, I think uh, we all have rights. Uh, I believe it's personal choice and I don't think anything should be mandatory. Simple as that. Councilmember Tolba, uh, taking a different approach, the mayor of New York City, uh, rather than mandating vaccines, has said that if you want to participate in city life starting in September, uh, 
they are going to require vaccinations for certain venues so that you have to show proof of vaccination in New York City to go into a restaurant, to go into a bar, to go to a gym. What are your thoughts on that? That yes, you can choose not to be vaccinated, Mayor de Blasio says, but if you make that choice, essentially you don't get to participate. If we don't mandate vaccines, could this be a way to ensure more community uh, safety? Well, I, you know, I don't believe uh, we should be, you know, I believe businesses, right? Uh, will take every precaution to make sure that one, the people that work in the establishment is safe and also the people coming into the establishment is safe. And that's what makes you know our country great that we have this entrepreneur spirit, right? And I don't think that these, these business owners put their life into something, you know, and I, and I honestly believe it all my heart that these people will do whatever they can, again, to keep the establishment safe and keep people safe. So pushing laws and um, maybe even backpedaling to close things down is, is for me, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't sit well with that. You know, we uh, unfortunately, Councilmember Tobo has to leave us here uh, in about a, a few minutes because he has we'll another part of commitment. We'll do it again, yeah, but we'll we do, do want to, I want to put a pin in this COVID conversation. I want to ask you this question before you head out. Uh, yeah. and, and that's regarding just tourism and what we're seeing here in the islands. There's a lot of talk in the communities. Many people uh, are upset with the number of visitors that are coming to the islands. And uh, there is uh, talk to see an increase uh, or a crackdown on some of the illegal vacation rentals. Want to get your thoughts uh, from what you're hearing from your constituents in the community with the increased tourism. Do you think that in cracking down on these illegal Airbnbs is the way to go? Or what are your overall thoughts about what we're seeing with the tourism industry here on the island of Oahu? Well, we know it was coming, right? We know that Hawaii right now is the number one uh, destination because we're safe. And I'm, you know, I'm hoping that we can have that tough conversation about, you know, cracking down on uh, Ill illegal renters. And, you know, I'm definitely off for that. And I think, you know, Part of getting quality tourism is uh, uh, making sure that we enforce a lot of you know a lot of things that we have already on the book. So uh, I, 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 you know, I believe that you know uh, what we one. I think we wasn't we weren't prepared, right? Obviously, we talked about like preparing for this. Um, tourists coming into Hawaii. And I don't think we were we were prepared, but I also do think that, you know, as we open, you know, we'll find, I'm optimistic that we can find uh, solutions to these challenging um, uh, problems. Before you go, and we know we gotta go in just a minute and then we're gonna focus in on council member Tupola, but I wanna ask you just to reflect uh, really briefly and then we'll let you go on what the last few months have been like and uh, how's this first foray into politics going? Oh, it's awesome. I mean, not too many people at 53 can say uh, they're doing something different. You know, I love my community. I think at the end of the day, that's the reason why I ran, because I love the people in my neighborhood. I love this island. And uh, I, I, I'm hoping that if there's anything that I can do in this next four years is show people that, you know, you can do the things that you love and you can serve your community. And, and we need more voices out there to, uh, to, to feel the same way. You know, the, you know, when you love your community and you want to see change, you either, you know, stay in the box and just complain or you make an effort and you step out the box. And that's what I did. I knew I was going to be criticized, right? He's just a comedian, but at the end of the day, my heart is in the right place and I like help people. And that's the reason why I think I was elected. So, We'll get him, Andrea. Godwin Ogi Tawa, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll thanks, hope you have more time with you uh, in the future, but thanks so much for being a part of the beginning part of this show. Thanks so much. And, and back over to you, uh, Council Member Tupola. Uh, if we can just uh, circle back and your thoughts on my question to uh, the councilman about the tourism uh, industry, what we're seeing here in the island, and your thoughts on residents pushing back because of the amount of visitors that we're seeing. How do you think we help to uh, regulate that? Well, you know, I think that now that we've had that lull of 
really being at the beach with just local residents, with our families. I mean, I even went to Waikiki during the pandemic and I was just shocked because there really was just, you know, people who live here in Hawaii that were enjoying the areas. Of course, upon the return of tourism, it's been this knee-jerk reaction of people just, you know, all these spaces and places where we used to have, you know, an enjoyable time with our families now crowded with tourists and it's been i feel like a long time coming i'm not sure how much you guys have covered this but you know derek kawakami the mayor on Kauai, one of the things they did at haena which is at the north end of Kauai island was that they actually made a permitting process so that only x amount of permits are given a day because it was crazy there were so many cars on the road that people were getting hit and we've had this same circumstance happen on oahu but we've never taken any any uh steps towards curbing some of the abuse of the areas, the illegal parking, the over amount of people that were hiking. And re the reality is, is there are some areas in Hawaii that they're just not made to support that many people. Mauna Willie Falls closed down. I mean, there's all these places where they really have to think, is there a capacity limit? Just like you would have a capacity limit in a stadium, in a uh, bar, in, there's always a capacity limit for safety, for health. So I think some of the things that they did out there, which they didn't restrict it for uh, residents, you can still get a permit, but they did restrict the amount of people that are able to go there. HTA paid for the security guard that stands at the front. I've been there. You have to apply for the permit a day. The residents get preference over visitors. There's X amount that is given out. I think there has to be some really big thought into understanding if these areas and the infrastructure in these areas, whether beaches, whether hikes, whether um, scenic lookouts actually have a capacity and if for safety, there should be some um, rules so that there can actually, actually be a quality visit to Hawaii. I want to go back to uh, what we were talking about with council member Tolba before he had to go on New York city's approach. You know, I, I I'm given your vaccination status, I'm guessing that you wouldn't support mandating vaccines, but what about allowing private businesses or having some kind of city ordinance, which is what they're doing in New York that says that you can't go to a restaurant if you don't show proof of vaccines. You know, they already tried that. It was covered on the news last week. And a lot of restaurants here in Hawaii said that they were getting people getting aggravated, getting angry, wanting to fight people upon entering the restaurant. So the coverage they had on the news showed that the Restaurant Association tried to implement this. Now, bear in mind, hypothetically, talking about an idea is different than the implementation of an idea. So trying to implement that on a local level, having a business now become a bouncer, or having to have security guards in the front, if people get irate, you have to try to take them down, call the police. I mean, these are things that people are doing preventatively to make sure that it's safe. How many other things could we do preventatively to make sure that people who are entering are safe? Like I brought up earlier, I feel like ever since the pandemic moved through 2020, that on our in our county, we've abandoned any type of community testing. And so even though, you know, Kale brought up earlier, oh, there's this amount inside your district, what if there's more than that? We don't know. We don't have regular community testing that's um, where anybody can drive through and we can test. You have to go find a place. And granted, there are places that allow for vaccinations. But what I'm explaining, which I hope you guys can see, and Clay, you're from Big Island. I mean, there's 300 people a day driving through the Civic, the Afuk Chinen uh, Civic Center in Hilo. And that's just local community members. Imagine if we actually had community sites where people could regularly go through and test, we would probably know more about how to isolate the spread. That laboratory at the airport is owned by the city and county of Honolulu. Kirk Caldwell bought it. I've encouraged our mayor to use the laboratory more than just at the airport and try to expand their community approach because like I said, the testing is a detection method. The vaccination is a preventative measure. In the area we are at now, we need both. And so if we increase the testing capacity uh, here on the island of Oahu, uh, as you are suggesting, uh, and we see those numbers become larger because, uh, as you noted, there could be more people in the community that just simply don't know. Uh, let's say that number does inflate on, on the island. We've heard from the lieutenant governor and from Dr. Char that those who are doing the contract tracing can't keep up. The, real, the reality is for them to be trying to find 20,000 people and trying to contract trace with all these people uh, is a bit difficult for the department to handle. Uh, so if we have that increase in numbers with this increased testing, 
uh, what does that lead to? I mean, do you do you feel that us having a better sense of how many people in the community will then equate to us helping to slow the spread of COVID-19 with this Delta variant and how contagious it is? Yeah, and that's you know what I mentioned earlier with the amount of people in Utah where thousands, if not tens of hundreds of thousands of people went through COVID so that it pushed through their community and the immunity levels were brought up. So there's it's either one or the other. Either we're going to push on the brakes and we're going to say, yes, we don't want to go through this. We don't want immunity. We want to push vaccinations or we're going to push through it and actually start to investigate and see how much the numbers are. And then we would have to alter the way that we contact trace, because if in reality, contact tracing is not effective now, then what can we do to alter that? Meaning for individuals like myself who might have contracted COVID but didn't have any symptoms, needed to isolate, but didn't have the need for oxygen. My sister-in-law just got COVID. She was on oxygen for a week and a half because she needed it, because she couldn't breathe. So there are a varying spectrum of what happens when you have COVID. So then do we have to contract chase in a way that those who have those high symptoms that really need the care are then able to get that, whereas those who don't, they're able to report it. The whole thing that we learned through COVID, adapt, learn, evaluate, get better. And so I think that's what we need to do as we morph through this is we have to learn what are other ways that we can go through this more effectively? What are better ways that we can educate the community on how to care for themselves through this? You know, school started yesterday. I know that you're a mom. Are you satisfied with the distance learning options for families right now? Yeah. I mean, I think that they're doing it as best they can. But back to my previous comment about the DOE and DOH, they got 46 million in May. In May of this year, our state, and you can look that up because President Biden had a press release and he released how much money was gonna go into each state. Do you know that other states started to test weekly, even in summer school, throughout the summer, and that on the first day of school that they had weekly testing, why? Because the federal government gave the money to pay for it. And so I think that that's where the DOH and the DOE right now is actually trying to get that up and going. They're hoping to start testing in a couple weeks, but that's where we have to get ahead of what's coming at us and be well prepared for it. If we get funding from the federal government, then we have to immediately decide how are we gonna ex execute the contract? How can we make these schools safe? Because the statistics show that it was worse for the children to have this knee jerk reaction to going to school, pulling back, you can go to school, now you can't go online. Teachers, now you have to do two jobs, one in person, one online. So I think moving forward, what we need to do is we have to be able to open up all the options and then we have to use federal funding expeditiously to provide these testing options for families. And at these testing events, provide the vaccination so that people can come to these testing things and still have the option to do one or the other or both. So I think that's where it's really going to start to see a difference is when we're able to provide these resources due to the government funding that we received and start to really help our communities. You know, the big news coming out today, just moments ago, the OIA announced that they will delay the start of fall sports to late September with athletes being required to be fully vaccinated to participate. As someone who has helped with the return of your safe sports program that you advocated for, what are your thoughts on this decision by the OIA? I think it's late. Are we kidding? It's August 2nd. So families have made decisions to move out of our state already. My own classmates, I just talked to one of my classmates, she moved to Utah so her son could go play football there. And I was like, Kel, you're gonna move your whole family? She's like, it's his senior year. I don't know what's gonna happen with the OIA. They haven't released the schedule yet. We wanna make sure our son plays. He loves playing sports. This might equal you know, him being able to go to college. So I really feel like whatever decision needed to be made should have been made so that a schedule could be released and families would be able to know. You know, with the return of sports, I've been working with Ray Fugino at the OIA and of course, Uncle Blaine Geisen at the ILH because if families don't have options, if a schedule is not released, if games are not scheduled, then families have to make other plans. They have to determine whether or not they're gonna stay in Hawaii because of the limited options that we have. So actually, I was actually gonna call Ray right after this because I just I just saw it released today. And at the end of the day, I'm not here to tell anyone what to do. I'm here as a public servant to provide options. Okay, where can I go? Where's the funding at? Andrea, they're making us do this. How can we get testing expedited? How can we bring down the cost? 
any obstacles that the OIA or the ILH has, they've brought it to me and I've tried to help them to brainstorm through it. Okay, parks are closed, Andrew. Can you talk to DPR? Get us a waiver for this so that we can have PE at the fields. So I'm trying to move all these pieces because just because safe sports was allowed doesn't mean all of the logistics were figured out. Every day I'm trying to figure out logistics to help these kids get out there because extracurricular was one of the main reasons why kids were in school. And this is what Superintendent Kishimoto said in the very onset of it, is that they saw a decline in students wanting to come to school when there was no extracurricular offered. And that's why it's important for the DOH and the DOE to release that they are gonna offer weekly testing for all extracurricular activities. They need to release that as soon as possible so that families know that there's a safe option. I wanna bring in this question from Nani and she says, Andrea, will you run for governor? There's been talk about a possible run a candidacy. Do you uh, have any news to share with us this morning? <laughs> no. So I, I have decided, you know, the night of the election when I was elected as a city council member, of course, still in my heart, I really wanted to run for governor. Um, I was 37 when I ran the first time and I had a lot to think about. You know, a lot of lessons learned. When you run for governor, you learn so much so quick. But I did get that feeling the night of the election. Andrea, be mindful of the stewardship you've been given and be good to the people who have been good to you. And I understand that the people on the West Side trust me and they want me to serve just as I told them I was when I was going when I ran for city council. And so I'm going to finish my four year term as a city council member. And I knew that. I knew that stepping into the city council race that if I won, that I would be out of the running for governor in 2022. And it's for me and for my family, we prayed about it and we're okay about that decision. And I just wanted to, you know, express my love to the people of Hawaii who do support me for governor and know that I am preparing myself. When I first ran, the, the feeling I got to run for governor happened when I was in Kohala on the big island. And the feeling I got was prepare yourself now. And so the preparatory state for anybody running for an office as high as governor is long. Uh, it's something that you can't calculate, but it's important because it's not just about winning the governor's race. It's about becoming the governor, being somebody that people trust, getting to the level of understanding the issues of Hawaii and being able to solve those issues. You know, before we let you go, we just wanted to get your thoughts on, on this new makeup of the council. We know that there are a number of you who are new, who are serving on the council for the first time, uh, difference in dynamics with a new mayor as well with the administration. How have these first few months or first half of the year, I should say now by this point, uh, been for you with the overall dynamics of the council and the um, relationship that you have with the Blangiardi administration? Um, I've enjoyed the first few months. I'll be very honest, serving in a nonpartisan office just getting down to the grit of what needs to happen, what roads need to get fixed, what items the community needs, I enjoy it. I do think that um, serving alongside two of my colleagues that are also coming in graduates, you know, we have a camaraderie between us. The five of us who are new, we have a camaraderie between us. Like everyone has certain things that we all kind of jive together at different moments. And I love that. I always say, you know, work together when you can, work alone when you have to. But collaborative work is really what's going to bring forward our county is the more that we can collaborate and work together, the higher and the greater the impact will be on how we serve the people. Working with the current mayor has been amazing. I feel very reassured that Mayor Blangiardi, you know, with no political background is actually making decisions based upon what he feels is best. And it's been a breath of fresh air to talk to him and know that He's not being politically advised. He's not taking a certain party stance to, into consideration. He really is weighing the pros and cons out on his own and trying to make the best step forward. He's been very open to me meeting with him, talking with him regularly. I talk to him at least once a week or to um, the managing director because they want to hear the input. If we succeed as council members, they succeed as an administration. Councilwoman or council member, Andrew Tupola, thank you so much for being with us this morning. We appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your experience, and we do hope to have you on again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mahalo.
Well, interesting to hear her thoughts there. Um, and it was news to me that she and her family had contracted COVID. She shared that firsthand experience um, and her choice not to get the vaccine at this time. Uh, she obviously does not support vaccine mandates. We have heard from uh, basically all four county mayors saying that they are considering making those mandatory for county employees. That's not something she's supporting. She is really pushing for increasing the testing uh, in, in her district and throughout the state. Uh, she says that that's something that could be very meaningful right now. And uh, also a part of this show, if you missed it earlier, was Council Member uh, Augie Toba, who also uh, shared his concerns over what's happening in his community, but also saying that he would never mandate any sort of vaccine. And to allow people to have that option is something that he will continue to push for, while also trying to make sure that those in his community, again, he represents those in the Eva Beach community, do have access to the vaccine for those who would like to uh, seek out that option. But again, uh, for a community like his, there is uh, a growing number of uh, cases that are happening in his district. Uh, but him saying again that he will continue to push uh, for more resources, but not make it necessarily a uh, mandate or would not support any sort of mandated approach. She also, they both addressed the idea of tourism and this influx that we're seeing. And we're going to be addressing this uh, on Friday when we have a representative of Southwest Airlines joining us. Uh, it's the first time that Southwest has re been represented on this program. You know, Maui Mayor Mike Victorino has asked airlines to scale back some of those flights. Uh, I don't think that those calls are going heated right now. So how do you balance running a business that brings in tourists to Hawaii with the needs of the community? We're going to be talking to them about that. Interesting to hear her talk about Hannah. We have talked about that with Mayor Kawakami on this program. Um, and there are a number of proposals on all the islands that the, the mayors are looking at to try to do some restrictions, in, enforcing parking, um, at, you know, increasing the permit fee for camping. That was something that's talked about in Kauai to really try to keep tourists in tourism districts and also to try to limit the strain on natural resources. Yeah, that conversation on Friday should be an interesting one to be able to speak to that representative from Southwest Airlines to get his take on the overall market and what he's seeing with visitors that are entering the island and how well they're or how they have been doing uh, in these first few months after some of those restrictions have been lifted with the Safe Travels program. We look forward to that conversation. Also, I want to remind you, happening today, we have a career expo that's happening. That's right. This is happening at the Neil Blaisdell Exhibition Hall. It's happening right now. It goes on till three o'clock. It's free general admission. There are COVID-19 safety protocols in force. That includes mask wearing, social distancing, temperature checks, and proof of vaccination or a negative COVID-19 test result. You can pre-register at the website you see there, hawaiicareerexpo.com. Uh, we do encourage you, if you are looking for a job, this is a great way to uh, get your name and face out there. That's right. Well, we thank you for being a part of today's conversation. We'll see you right back here on Friday for a, another edition of Spotlight Hawaii brought to you by Shamanad University. Aloha. Aloha.